Trinanda, Ekroso, good afternoon and welcome everybody. Thank you so very much for joining us today. My name is Rudy Alleman. I'm a Pro Vice Chancellor here at Cardiff University. I head up the College for Physical Sciences and Engineering and I double up as the PVC for international and student recruitment. It's a really great pleasure for me to welcome you all to this webinar on pursuing net zero with alternative fuels. I should just in housekeeping remind you all that today's research showcase will be recorded. We will send you a link to the recording, which you're welcome to share with uh, as far as you like. At Cardiff University, we're absolutely clear that addressing climate change is a non-negotiable. We will contribute to stabilizing and in the longer run reversing the trend of increasing temperatures by changing our own behaviors, by future-proofing our buildings and how we op operate as, an, as a business, as a university. Sustainability is becoming an integral part in everything we do, in our teaching, in our education, and of course, in our research. The need to reduce human-made greenhouse gases and achieve, a net zero, achieve net zero is clearly one of the greatest and most urgent challenges our world has faced probably since the Industrial Revolution. And while part of the route to net zero is mapped, there's an awful lot to do. The research we do at Cardiff is making significant contribution to this end. We are taking the UN sustain Sustainable Development Goals absolutely seriously in all we do. We have set up a net zero innovation institute, which is focused on the need to expand renewable energy potential, foster a more sustainable economy, and indeed reduce, help reduce and capture carbon emissions. I'm really delighted to have you all here, and I'm delighted that this afternoon you will have the chance to hear about one of the Institute's work programs, which is research into developing the future utility for off-grid alternative fuels. Currently in the UK, some staggering number, I'm just going to give you some staggering numbers actually. Currently in the UK, some 4.5 million tons of oil are consumed annually in the off-grid industrial market. These energy intense processes contribute the emissions of 4.2 metric tons of carbon dioxide per, dioxide per year. Decarbonization of these sites presents a significant but pressing challenge, a challenge that we need to address quickly. Our scientists and our engineers in the university are working in partnership with industry to develop the capability of using an alternative fuel to address this very challenge. The use of green ammonia has the potential to decarbonize off-grid industrial heating. It can be distributed easily, stored inexpensively, and by using infrastructure has well been established over in many sectors already. This is really important. It, it, it's important to understand how key this is. We cannot overemphasize that. You'll, you will hear how our research is solving the technical barriers to that ammonia combustion boilers so that combustion boilers can be developed and actually brought to market, capable of meeting the demands of industrial heating, but also providing a technically viable solution to decarbonization. I'm really delighted to introduce to you our speakers for this afternoon who will share their story, which hopefully will become your story. It's our story in this world. It's a really key thing to do. They are Professor August, Augustin Valera Medina, who is a co-director of the Net Zero Innovation Institute, and also Dr. Sayed Mashruk, who is actually somebody from, who's graduated at Cardiff uh, three years ago, is now a lecturer and is also in the Net Zero Innovation Institute. Both of them, as I said, work within the center of excellence for ammonia technology. And I miss that. Uh, Augustine is actually also an alum of this university. We'll hear from Augustine and Syed shortly. And following this, you will have an opportunity to ask your questions and we will do our best to answer them. We've already received questions in advance, but if you have any to ask, please enter them in the Q&A function on the Zoom call. You can do this at any time uh, and we will try and address as many as we can. But for now, I'm absolutely delighted to hand over to Augustine, who will give you uh, uh, his presentation, which will then be followed by Syed. Over to you two. Thank you very much for the presentation. And uh, I, uh, I'll start sharing my screen so everyone can see 
uh, what we've been talking about. Uh, and uh, again, once more, thank you very much for the invitation and the presentation of uh, the work that we've been doing. And uh, here is just a taste of uh, what is uh, this program all about. So, so I'll focus on talking about our uh, vision of creating a center of excellence on ammonia technology and the work that we have been pursuing, especially in the area of boiler applications. So the first question is uh, always, why do you want to do this? Why do you want to use ammonia as a potential fuel to decarbonize the grid? Uh, if we have all these sources of energy, like wind energy, solar, even marine, all across the UK and worldwide, uh, one of the main problems that we have is that these are very intermittent. And on those grounds, the problem that we face is that if we don't have a way to store some of this energy, we could then go into situations where if for whatever reason they stop working, then we lose power. And that goes not only into our homes, but also we're talking about hospitals, industries, uh, sites that are required to then run on a continuous basis and uh, that uh, require, uh, need all this energy. So that's one of the cases that happened just a few years ago. Many of you here in the UK might remember that uh, over a period of a, a couple of days, uh, there was a big loss of power in the Midlands, and that was caused by the uh, loss of power coming from wind, wind energy. And that day in particular, the grid was running at around 48% using wind power and uh, losing those connections uh, led to almost 1 million of people not being able to actually uh, get access to the energy. So therefore, one of the things that again, this kind of situation similar that has happened in the US, in Australia, across many other European countries, is that we require always a method of storing this energy. And one of those methods is actually through the use of energy such as chemicals. So uh, one of the chemicals that we've heard about, and probably many of you have just heard over the last few years, is the use of hydrogen. Hydrogen has the potential of uh, being consumed, and as we do it, we produce only water. So as you can see here in this diagram, we got, as in Wales and many other regions across the world, a path towards the decarbonization of the economy using hydrogen. So in this diagram, you can see very easily how from the 2020 to the 2030, the Welsh government came up with these ideas of then supporting the use of hydrogen. And they were trying, they've been trying to do it through then small programs, projects that are just demonstrators, replacement of the use of natural gas into the grid, using hydrogen for transportation uh, and uh, fuel cells. And as we progress over the line, you can see that we go into bigger systems, like for example, trains running on hydrogen, heavy duty type of systems, then the decarbonization of buses, taxes, and all the grid. And then finally, reaching a point where our industries will be running on this chemical. Now, there's one of the things that happens with hydrogen that is complex and difficult to store because it's just the smallest molecule that we got in the universe. Therefore, we can find some other ways to actually store some of that energy. I'm not saying that we're not going to use hydrogen. What I'm saying is that there will be some niche applications where we can find some other solutions that will be much better for other chemicals such as ammonia. The case of ammonia is a really interesting one because it's a molecule that we have used for a very long period of time, almost 150 years, and we know how to handle it. So all the fertilizers that we got are mainly produced by ammonia. And on that uh, line of thought, it is the second most commercialized chemical worldwide. So we have, as a civilization, a very good understanding on how to manage this uh, chemical. We have more hydrogen than in hydrogen itself, because finally what happens is that we got uh, more uh, atoms in ammonia than we have in hydrogen. In hydrogen, we only have two atoms. In ammonia, we got three of hydrogen. We have all this infrastructure that we have been developing over the years, uh, goes from uh, pipelines, trains, trucks, vessels, large scale, uh, facilities that can store it. So it's already there. And then finally, it can reduce up to 94% of the CO2 that we're now emitting. And this is because there are 6% remaining is embedded into the materials and some other parts of the process that have to do with the CO2 that we're using. So for that reason, uh, uh, countries uh, such as Japan are now exploring in a commercial scale the use 
of ammonia to the carbonize the uh, grids and it's something that is still uh, to be seen here in the west i'm talking about north america canada all the americas and obviously europe and africa that are still have to then make that jump so on that basis uh, what we got is a study done by the hydrogen council and what they did was to analyze these different methods of distributing the hydrogen and what they came up with was that after evaluating the use of ammonia liquid hydrogen and some other carriers organic carriers then uh, doing an analysis between the uh, uh, production of this hydrogen in locations like chile like the middle east like australia that have lots of resources and then developing the uh, methods to then deliver that to economies like ours or the us or japan where there's a lot of requirement of energy, they found out that the costs of doing that were actually almost the same between all these different scenarios. Now, one of the things that is interesting to see in this diagram, in this analysis that they have done on the left-hand side, is that the ammonia, the NH3 component, the first one that appears in this diagram from Chile to the US, has a very large part related to cracking. Cracking means that we'll split up the molecule and then what that we do, we get nitrogen and hydrogen coming out and then we get the hydrogen finally into the grid. But if we can reduce that part, you can see that it's almost a third of the cost that we got for the distribution of hydrogen. So meaning that if we don't do it, we don't do the cracking, then that's the most profitable, cost-effective solution that we got from the lot. And a similar way, we have the case of the energy density that from all the different zero carbon fuels that exist has the highest for ammonia, even higher than lithium batteries. And the reason is that Again, it can be converted into liquid. It's very easy to do so on the uh, very low pressures or very high temperatures. And it's a competitive fuel, even to methanol and coal. Uh, when it comes to then, uh, the fossils that we're trying to replace, there's again the difficulty of uh, the uh, uh, density uh, of the energy of this chemical. But we have the CO2 that we will have still to account for if we don't go for these options. So. Realizing that and understanding that ammonia has a lot of potential, there's now a lot of programs going around the world that are trying to use ammonia as a fuel. So instead of going and thinking only go for fertilizing applications, they're now considering then the development of large facilities to then deploy this fuel to locations like Europe, Japan, and the US. One of them is the uh, One From Air products that they're setting up in Saudi Arabia, a 5 billion program to then develop a system and a facility capable of producing blue, uh, green uh, hydrogen and ammonia just from renewable sources. And what they're planning to do is all that chemical then distributed worldwide as a uh, method for energy production. In the same way, Australia is looking into now programs that are actually targeting this in large scale. And one of them is a very interesting case where they ditch an electricity connection, just again, uh, uh, pipelines and uh, cables going to the uh, South Asian region. And now they have thought about how would be the most flexible and most efficient method to actually go for that option. And it's ammonia, the one that is coming at the top. Because if you do the connection, then what happens is that you are essentially married to that uh, program, to uh, those countries and uh, those agreements. Whereas in the case of ammonia, then it's flexible and depending on the market, you can then distribute it or change who's going to buy it. And uh, as well as an issue that comes with the case of independency and energy security. Similarly, uh, Norway is working on programs for the development of marine engines working on ammonia, so they will displace diesel and propane that are being used right now. General Electric and companies like IHI, that is a big company in Japan, are looking into the development of large gas turbines for the production of energy. In the same way that Mitsubishi has now announced that in the next two years, three years, they will have the first large power station working on this fuel. And China is not uh, falling behind. It's actually showing now at a very large scale 
the replacement of coal in their large power plants using ammonia. And the results that they're getting are fascinating. They're getting better performance, lower emissions, and then finally, a system that is compliant to what the uh, energy is requiring to produce. On those lines, there has been a lot of progress, especially in Japan, where now they're leading on the subject to the extent that now they have a 345 million program just dedicated to the use of ammonia as a replacement fuel. They have demonstrators that go in a very large power scale and can produce enough energy for entire cities councils, and even regions of the entire country, and that are just targeting the replacement of this coal by the ammonia. Companies like IHI and JERA are already selling some of their technologies to countries like Malaysia, Thailand, China, India, and many other regions like uh, Singapore in the Southeast uh, Asian countries. So that opens lots of opportunities to uh, kind of develop a center and the expertise to start using ammonia here in Europe with uh, very little uh, knowledge in uh, many countries, again, that have all these advantages like Germany, Poland, etc., and that are looking into other alternatives, we have this positioning um, of Wales to become one of the European and uh, Western leaders on the subject for the use of ammonia as an alternative fuel. So along those lines, we have created the Center of Excellence on Ammonia Technologies, where we have focused on many different areas that are targeting the deployment of these technologies at different scales for very small systems to these large power stations that I've been talking about. And things that we have included uh, just contemplate the analysis of fundamentals that we do as part of the scientific research uh, developments and uh, outcomes that we need to produce as a university, but we also have have a lot of uh, development going on with the industries. And that goes into the uh, design of engines, uh, gas turbines, propulsion systems, internal combustion engines for backup power, like in hospitals or in locations that require some kind of energy if, the loss, if there's a loss to the grid. Heat pumps as well that can be used for farming, house and domestic locations. Furnaces that uh, will then touch furnaces and boilers later on down in this presentation. Uh, farming as well for uh, trucks and heavy duty components and some other things that are more fundamental with the physics of plasmas. And one of the components that as well has been critical is public perception. So we have a lot of engagement with communities for the understanding on how they perceive the use of this chemical as a way of transitioning to a net zero environment. So as part of that, we got many outcomes. Uh, some of them relate to first demonstrators worldwide, directing some of these working groups just in the UK, policy briefings, lots of different publications that include books, chapters, and then journal papers of the highest quality. We are editors as well of the first journal on ammonia energy in the world, and we're leading as well the first symposium on ammonia energy. So uh, this one is an academic effort to then bring together everyone working on the subject to understand and progress faster on it, and sharing many other aspects of this uh, fascinating field. So one of the questions that I will get, get asked is why shall we pick up Wales as that destination to have ammonia uh, and this ammonia center? And uh, as I mentioned before, ammonia complements the hydrogen long storage distribution uh, thematic. And we have one of the largest expertise that uh, there's in all Europe. Among all European universities, we have one of the longest uh, in terms working on it. On that line, we have uh, supported the development of marine systems, power systems, the production of heat in home, uh, UK, uh, European, and international agendas. Along those lines, we have as well expertise and uh, programs developing offshore wind storage and shipping as part of our Net Zero Institute. And we have unique centers of doctoral training that allow us to uh, tackle uh, the training programs in uh, uh, undergraduate, master, and PhD degrees for sustainable energy and Net Zero becoming a, a fundamental a force and a strategy to the deployment of this, uh, this, this idea. Our vision is eventually to get to a point of having the first worldwide ammonia community uh, here in Wales. 
And with that, we are bringing all these aspects, all the uh, different interdisciplinarity that we got as part of the Net Zero Innovation Institute that will bring uh, the expertise from engineers, from scientists, from chemists, from physics, from social scientists, etc., to play this role and then decarbonize these communities all across the country and beyond. So as part of that, we have uh, developed this umbrella uh, from the Net Zero Innovation Institute to then host the Center of Excellence on Ammonia Technology that will allow us to then create bespoke facilities and expertise on the subjects of heat, like boilers, furnaces that can be used for glass, steel, cement, industries, porcelain, ceramics, etc., that we're now attempting in some other projects, power in gas turbines, internal combustion engines, transport for the aerospace sector, terrestrial in mobility, and heavy duty, heavy load for uh, farming and shipping, social sciences and geopolitics, because we need the regulations, we need to engage with the community to then get Order into the development of this idea. Biotechnology and physics as well are playing their important part as part of the analysis of the toxicology, the design of new systems for measuring, etc. So we can eventually get to that point to develop these first uh, worldwide uh, community and then finally uh, have a, a place in uh, the green parks that are now under development here across, uh, across the region. As part of that, and uh, with some of the cases that uh, we can uh, show us uh, being very successful, we have developed a new Borner technology as part of our base uh, fuel switching competition. So uh, the idea was to replace propane in locations far from the grid, farms, uh, uh, distilleries, poultry, etc. As part of that, we uh, were very successful to then demonstrate the concept, and we are now engaged in a second phase. Second phase that has allowed us to obtain a 3.7 million program to the development of the technologies that eventually will pursue the design and demonstration from medium to large scale systems that can be commercialized somewhere else. We are as well supporting Royal Society Awards that are as well being a uh, demo, being a, a complementary to these demonstration, demonstration systems, and we're leading some of the global centers that ammonia can uh, bring. So as part of that, some the technologies that we're putting forward as well, looking to the heat pump development, boilers for crack ammonia, heat recovery systems, marine uh, uh, designs, etc. And I'll pass the presentation to Syed. Hello, everyone. Uh, Syed Mashuk here. So now, uh, as part of that phase one of the M1 project that Agustin just mentioned, we have completed some techno-economic analysis. You can see on the top right corner of the slide, there is a graph that's showing the different in cost or difference in cost of ownership of different technologies. We have fossil at the right end, and then we have ammonia, compressed hydrogen, liquid hydrogen, direct electrification and heat pump. And as you can see from the graph, the cheapest one after fossil comes is the m with that with, with ammonia power system. Now, people always ask me, why, uh, how come ammonia is cheaper where ammonia uh, hydrogen is being used to, to make ammonia? The, 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 the reason is, again, ammonia is very easy to store and transport, whereas for hydrogen, for the second, uh, uh, second one there, to compress hydrogen, you need between 350 to 800 bar, whereas for the liquefying hydrogen, you need minus 250 degrees Celsius. So your, your energy requirement is very, very high for hydrogen. And that's where ammonia become very relevant and very usable to replace uh, to, uh, as a carrier of hydrogen. Now, there was some work in collaboration with Tata Steel uh, and Southus Industry has, uh, has led to the recognition of several streams, product of waste gases, from where ammonia can be extracted and then can be used to, to produce uh, uh, heat. Uh, current work uh, from the M1 project is now going on with flow gas, where we're aiming to have a burner up and running at 1.5 megawatt power. Next slide, please. Now, from here, you can see that the flame you are seeing here on the on the uh, on, on the right uh, on the left hand side, you can see the frame flame is uh, orange. So that's a distinctive difference uh, from um, uh, traditional fossil fuel blue blue flame, because in ammonia there is more NH two is the main radical. So there's an orange flame in there. So that was our lab scale experiment that was done 
in the phase one of MBURN. And for the phase two, we are moving this 30 kilowatt experiment to the next picture. You can see a, a big combustion chamber that's also in Cardiff University in the School of Engineering, where we're going to run between 300 to 500 kilowatts uh, and, and prove this concept in a bigger scale. The final outcome of this project will be to install this, uh, install this patented and designed in Cardiff uh, combustion system in a one megawatt boiler system that will be running for 24-7 for uh, 30 days in a customer site. Uh, and that will be uh, to achieve TRL level between seven and nine. And at the bottom left hand corner, you can see some of the uh, CFD uh, analysis that we're conducting to, co to complement our experimental data and to move from 30 kilowatt to one megawatt scenario. And then on the right hand side, you are seeing that how noxious the, the way we are burning ammonia, we actually have at the end, just nitrogen and water coming out. So you have no carbon, so no carbon dioxide. And the ammonia, the problem was NOx, but we have found a way in Cardiff to minimize the NOx to zero ppm, to sub, sub zero ppm. So by doing that, at the end of the chamber, you're only having nitrogen and water coming out and you're actually having a, a, a solution that is actually zero emissions in terms of global warming potential. At the bottom right of there, you have seen that we are also developing control strategies in uh, for ammonia-based flame using very simple, cheap uh, 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 chemical luminescence instruments where we can, we can, by using this instrument, we can actually identify the ammonia mole fraction in the flame and as well as different equivalence ratio where how the flame is changing. So more of this is more about to control how the flame is going to work and how we're going to control this ammonia-based flame. Next slide, please. Now, this is the final slide. So the immediate potential that we see of these uh, ammonia-based uh, combustion chambers is that in the Midford Haven in South Wales, we can have this LNG terminal, which can be converted into a green energy hub. So we, we're going to convert, replace the LNG with ammonia. So ammonia will be coming through sheep, uh, through, uh, through, gas, through gas line, uh, and uh, some of this ammonia will be cracked. To, to make hydrogen out of them. And some of the uh, ex, uh, the gas beer system will be using hydrogen. Other, other ammonia can be used directly for power generation as we are uh, showing with this particular M1 project that can be used directly for the power production and that can be go up to as high as 20 megawatts. And of course, that will be, uh, they, they can be used for particular activities as well. Uh, so with this, um, I'm going to finish our presentation. Thank you. Thank you both very much. It's really great to hear about all the stuff we're doing that we work, you know, you, you mentioned we work this, we, we do this not just at Cardiff University, we work in partnership with industry and really to bring green technologies to the market. You know, one of the great things we need to do is really, you know, I'm aware it's great to make everybody aware how, how key Cardiff University is in doing this. We're now moving on to a question and answer session. And I'm delighted to welcome a third panel member, James Rodman who is from, uh, this is the Business Development Director at Flowgas. Hi, James, good to have you. Uh, Flowgas are the industry partner on this project. So they work very closely with our researchers here in Cardiff. Great to have you here. I should just say, James, as you may be able to see, is somewhere in transit, and we hope that the connection will hold up. We had some problems earlier, but I think we fixed it. So that is very nice, good to have you. If members in the audience have questions to ask, please, uh, Put them in if you haven't already done so. I see we have some questions. We have more questions that are coming in just now. That's really nice. We will try and put them to the panelists. The panelists here, and they will try and do their best, their best to answer. Maybe I'll first start with a question that some of you have pre-submitted, uh, and maybe just ask you how easy, given we have people from university, academia, and industry, how easy is it for universities to partner with industry? Are universities doing this enough? I don't know who wants to answer. Augustin, you just seem to, you seem to have unmuted yourself. 
Yeah, I, I think it will be an interesting question, and I'd like to share as well my thoughts with James. Uh, so I guess it's a, a, a challenge always, because we tend to speak uh, different languages at some point. We're sometimes very technical and uh, very specific in our approaches, whereas they are uh, more practical and uh, want to then get the products out. Uh, but uh, one of the things that has been really good, uh, particularly for this program, has been that since the beginning, we uh, kept uh, an open conversation with, with James and uh, also we've always known since the beginning our uh, final aim and that has uh, been a, 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 a relationship that has led to successful outcomes from our first one and the uh, a point where we're now in time. Uh, what has been your, uh, your, your experience James working with us and other in institutions? Uh, well, I must admit, we haven't worked with any other institutions before until we came across Cardiff. You know, we, we we saw this the commercial opportunity for uh, the project Amberlin, you know, to take ammonia and see if we could burn it directly as a fuel. Uh, so we reached out to, to, to Bayes and looked at a funding pot. Uh, but then we need to find some very clever people to help us actually design this. So luckily, we stumbled across Cardiff University and Augustine and Syed. So, yeah, it's been very, very good. Very good. I can just maybe add to, to the person who asked me for everybody. You know, we, we, we partner with a lot of industry, uh, the whole sectors across many areas, and it's always been very productive. It's true that sometimes one has to learn to speak to one another a little bit, but that becomes in clear. The world becomes in, becomes more and more inclusive in science. Global develop, uh, sustainable development goals drive so many things that people learn to talk to one another better and better. So it's a really productive relationship, not just this one, but all the ones we have. I want to say shift a little bit the questioning to, to the economical viability of this, because uh, one question we got is, uh, could liquefied ammonia be an economically and practical solution for transportation? Does it really require low temperatures to maintain it in its liquefied state? So I'll take this one. Uh, so liquefied ammonia, it is the best solution because it ammonia is liquid at when you are at eight bar, it's liquid at 15 degrees Celsius. So you are actually not pressurizing too much and you don't have to take it, uh, the, think about temperature like the way you have to think about hydrogen. With the hydrogen, as I said in the presentation, you have to have 350 to 800 bar to gasify and liquefy at minus 250 degrees Celsius. So ammonia is a solution that can have both these obstacles taken care of. And at the same time, as Agustin mentioned, ammonia has more hydrogen than hydrogen itself. So we're actually moving more hydrogen than by moving ammonia as a liquefied ammonia. And if you can use ammonia for direct combustion, then you're taking out of the problem of cracking. So you're saving more energy. Great, good. So, so maybe I should stay on the topic, actually. So it's one of the questions is, you know, we hear a lot, there's a lot of talk about hydrogen for power, hydrogen as such, hydrogen gas. But of course, it's explosive if mishandled, it's difficult to deal with. Does ammonia come with any risks? And if so, what are they? How can you mitigate them? So ammonia is actually, in terms of risk of uh, explosion, is opposite of hydrogen. Ammonia is very hard to light, even to light up. So that's, again, another good side and bad side of ammonia. But then to mitigate this problem, we, we mix it with some hydrogen or some ethanol, some ethanol to make it more reactive and get an answer out of it. Our solution is to have ammonia hydrogen. We crack some of the ammonia to make some hydrogen and we make a blend out of it. And then we, we burn that. And it has similar structure, similar properties as uh, fossil fuel. In terms of... Uh, uh, problems with ammonia. So obviously, ammonia is toxic. Uh, ammonia is toxic, uh, uh, but again, saying that ammonia has been used in the fertilizer industry for over 100, 200 years. It's been being used. It's not. A, it's not like even though it's a, it has some health and safety issues. It's not like we're using it for the first time. We've been using it. We just have to have some more robust health and safety guidelines on the ammonia side of it. And as a part of this M1 project, we are doing that as well. We are, we are, we are, we are actually hired a third party specialist to look at these health and safety factors of ammonia in this kind of these obvious solutions. So yeah, so ammonia has more upside than I would say the downside. 
That's very good to hear. Uh, just staying on the same kind of topic, uh, one of the issues, of course, is price of ammonia. Last year, you know, the, 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 the participant says here, we all became so conscious of our gas and electricity consumption because, you know, all of a sudden we had to pay an awful lot more than before. Uh, is that maybe true? Is, is the cost of ammonia also affected with time? Obviously, is the best person to talk about that. Pro probably the best one would be James. I don't know, James, would you like to take this one? Forgive me, I didn't quite catch the question. I think my internet was a little bit. Is it a question over the price of ammonia? The, 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 the question is, you know, normal carbon dependent uh, fuel prices are really going up and down depending on world markets. All, you know, uh, uh, last year, you know, we had a real upshot of energy prices depending on the geopolitical tensions and everything. What, how stable are ammonia prices? Okay, so at the moment there is very little green or, or blue ammonia available on the market, but there are a number of large projects which are uh, building infrastructure or will be building infrastructure in Britain to import ammonia from the States, from the Middle East, um, and the indications that we've had, and I guess we're taking advantage of some of the subsidies from the, the IRA subsidy in the, in the US, but the indications are very favorable, um, you know, that the the ammonia imported price would be comparable to natural gas price um, that we saw last winter. Now that was a little bit higher than normal, um, but if we can get a green ammonia at that sort of price level, yeah. it's going to be very impressive. And, and that is likely to start coming in stream and being imported in 27, 28. So it's not too far in the distant future. Okay, great. We get a little bit of background from you, probably uh, flight announcements. You hope it's not yours, so you don't miss, you, so you don't miss it. Uh, I have another question which relates to this a little bit, I think. Of course, Wales, you know, is, 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 is a perfectly placed uh, country for this. You know, we have a lot of ammonia because it's used as fertilizers, as you said, so we need a lot of ammonia. So therefore, the ammonia is already here, and that's good. And it's, 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 a, it's a fantastic process. You know, we start in principle, ammonia is produced from uh, nitrogen, which is in the atmosphere, 78% of the air we breathe is is nitrogen, you convert it into ammonia, and in the end, it goes back to nitrogen. So that's a really nice, sustainable process. However, we need to produce the ammonia. And, to, and you know, traditionally, that's done by a very energy-intensive process, the Harbour-Bosch process. So how do we keep that? How do we keep, how do we, what's, what's the work that's being done to actually make the production of the ammonia that you use sustainable? That, that one is a, a fascinating question, and it comes down to the new technologies that are under development. So from our side, we tend to work on the uh, thermal part and the final use, the storage and the distribution of the chemical. Uh, but there are universities and also research groups working already on uh, different approaches to then produce ammonia sustainably. Uh, so the first one is, again, using these electrolyzers. Uh, so you have the split of water, produce the hydrogen, and then use a renewable energy energy to do so. so that's what we call green ammonia but the problem is that the third and the electrolyzers are still very expensive and the electricity requirements are very high so uh, these uh, universities and institutions what they're trying to do is jump into what we call generation three of ammonia production and generation three what is looking at is into the production of ammonia using only water and air and they will use a catalyst for a fuel cell that will allow us to uh, uh, then uh, produce the ammonia directly. So anyone that has access to renewable energy, air and water will be able to produce ammonia. So that, that's the idea. And uh, uh, on those lines, uh, right now, the amounts of ammonia that are produced that way are very little, We're still in infancy, very uh, early developments. But the whole industry is looking at that. So it's again the potential of uh, the holy grail of energy production if that happens. Thank you very much. Maybe shift just a little bit in terms of applications, because you, you, you talked all about off-grid, and that's, of course, why flow gas are involved in this. But uh, one of the questions we have here is, is, is the potential to use ammonia for aviation? 
it's 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 quite high and that's one of the po points that we have been trying to 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 expand as well so as we are speaking one of these programs that is going on is uh, between nasa and boeing to use ammonia as a hydrogen carrier and they are looking into the use of direct ammonia so they were uh, in the 70s uh, you know the beginning of the 80s a, a very interesting program where they use oxygen as a method of uh, boosting the ammonia flames and the uh, reactions that were they were producing for aviation were fantastic. So it was a program that was called the Viking program. I saw in one of the questions something related to uh, a, 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 a space exploration. It's actually one of the areas that satellites are now looking at because ammonia has that potential to be used as a fuel for satellites. So yes, there's a lot of uh, potential on that area and as well for uh, further in the future uh, from uh, many places in the, in the universe actually uh, having loads of ammonia. Thank you very much. One, one other question I have, maybe it's probably the, the final question we have time for, is the work we are doing at Cardiff going to lead to IP, intellectual property, which will generate income for the university, obviously for the researchers, but of course also add to the real production of this, to, to, to the ammonia used as an energy source being something viable. Yeah, so that's something that is really interesting. And uh, one of the things that has been really good is that since the beginning, uh, and I think that's what has kept this relationship with the industry very, very, very uh, uh, sane and, and healthy, is uh, that uh, we put forward uh, our patent that we produce not through this project, but through uh, EPSRC UKRI funding. So we initially started testing, get it into low TRL and then demonstrate it in uh, the lab uh, scale. And I'm passing that point was when we get in contact with flow gas. So we put forward this technology that we have been developing with government funding. And uh, with that, we keep all the patents, uh, we keep the uh, ownership and we can then expand it but then flow gas becomes that company that will exploit it commercially so again it works for everyone in that sense and i guess that's that's the reason of the success of uh, what we have done so far thank you very much Augustine. thank you very much syed and james thanks for joining us all and talking to us about this fantastic activity that's going on fantastic research something we should all not just at Cardiff, I think, in, in Wales and the UK, be proud of. There's so much good science going on here with lots of applications. It's fantastic. It's really a good example to show what you can do when researchers come together with industrialists, and I think it's really good. I would also like to thank our webinar audience for being with us. We hope you found this interesting. If we didn't get a chance to answer your questions, we will follow up with you directly. We know who you are, we will respond to your questions. We got a lot of good questions. We could only, unfortunately only answer a few of them. You will receive an email in the next few days with a copy of the recording and the links to register for future events. As I said before, if you would like to share the recording, please feel free to do so. I would also like to draw your attention to our next event in this series, investigating society's grand challenges, creating public value solutions for a better world, which is taking place on, the, on Thursday, the 18th of January at 5.15. Uh, if you are available, if you're interested, please do join us for that event. Uh, if you are here and you would like to get involved with Cardiff, we would like that very much. If you would like to volunteer time to help our students or indeed help us fundraise for our research, please follow the link that has just been put into the comments box on the screen now, or do get in touch with us directly. For myself, and on behalf of the speakers that we had today, I would like to thank you very much and say goodbye. Uh, see you next time.